This painting is habeas corpus. I did this painting as a part of a series of paintings around the time of my divorce. I got married in 1975 when I was 18. I was married for 30 years. And this painting was the most dramatic painting that I did during that series of paintings. I was really trying to exercise my feelings about uh, the difficulty of the divorce. There were a lot of emotions going around. So my family that you've seen in some of the other paintings gets um, you know, torn apart here. I think I'm symbolic of the central figure. This is the central figure. You have people pulling on him, lawyers, some trying to pull him to the gallows to be hung. A noose is around his neck already, or being placed around his neck. And over here with the gallows um, is the female figure who could possibly be ready to pull the lever. You see there's a, a fairground in the distance. There's stadium lights, like this is a drama which everyone's watching unfold as if a sporting event of some sort. This lawyer has a, a flask in his pocket maybe a little shady, but they're dressed as if for a wedding. They're wearing these like these stripes on their pants as if they're in formal attire, as if it's a wedding. You have this figure that's appeared, a sort of angelic figure. She actually had wings for a long time in the, in the studies and in the painting. But I um, decided to, instead of having the wings, just levitate her off the ground so she has no feet. She's actually floating up like an angelic figure. You know, she, she's wearing a wedding dress, but she's got the scissors here that could cut the rope to save this fellow who's in dire trouble. You see his uh, little break in reality there. Someone has punctured the neurosis. You can see through it. It's like a, a crack in the actual reality of the painting. At first, it looks like they're on some sort of boxing ring boxing ring like uh, George Bellows painting or there's a famous Norman Rockwell painting of a boxing ring and a, a woman is looking into the two figures that are fighting so it's like that's a canvas so that it's a little in joke on what canvas is so it's the canvas is the canvas that's painted but it's also the canvas on which the drama plays out so you see the little eye rings and then you realize that maybe the whole thing is really just a tableau. It's really not a real scene you're looking at at all. Maybe it's just a painted signboard. And these figures have come to the fair to witness it. They're in the foreground. You've got this oldest son here, number one. C, which is representative of different things, but possibly a, a, the artist's best friend, Casamingas, or someone else. You've got the Norman Rockwell or um, Joseph Boys figure with the hat. You've got two other sons here witnessing the drama that's being played out. The last thing that appeared in the painting was this child, this innocent, um, transparent child. And that happened out of necessity because the drama that was taking place was too, it was too heavy in the central, too many legs and too much going on. <clears throat> it was the complexity of the situation, the complexity of the feeling and I needed something to just go completely the other way. So I put this really innocent, naked child here, just standing in the middle of the action to be a witness. It's, it's the boy, it's the eternal boy, the pure air eternus. But all the numbers and letters represent things, just personal meanings of who everyone represents. Somewhere there's a little code and a drawing that tells what each one of those things represents. Habeas corpus means something like show me the body in Latin. Uh, it has to do with, there's, it's a writ and, and when you're, you're brought before the judges, uh, you have to be accused of, of the um, offense. And it's about guilt and innocence. There's a fair going on back there. But this, this stage is like a, could be like, you know, the canvas that's wrapped around the edge of a boxing ring. Yeah. No, it was really fun to paint. I painted it in Seattle. I painted it in my studio in Seattle after I had left Pennsylvania. I'd met Betsy. And um, I had a big, it was like an airport hangar down in South Seattle. And I was able to 
work in there and just work all this out. There are definitely elements of surrealism, for sure. I mean, I grew up, I mean, who, when you're young, everybody likes Salvador Dali, you know, I mean, that's who you like when you're young, you know, so I, I love that stuff, and Magritte, but, you know, you get older and you sort of, your tastes change, and, but you still retain some of it if you, if you ever responded to it. Um, magic realism, there was a time when magic realism was a, you know, a real phase of art. It came out of the sort of rural realists, and Andrew Wyeth was a big part of that initially. But I, I, I I don't like necessarily any <clears throat> label or category for the work. I mean, I don't, I don't label it myself, but I do feel like that there's a kind of uh, mystical tradition in a way that I feel like that that I feel like my work falls into, and it's it's and it's not the great painters like Rubens or Rembrandt or something. It's it's more of the kind of painters like um, you know Watteau, you know. Or, Balthus or, or Wyeth or even in some regards like Antonio Lopez Garcia and, and, and uh, Hammershoy, Wilhelm Hammershoy. There's a kind of distillation of the space, a distillation of time in the space, which isn't at all about realism. Realism is, you know, you see it in the moment and you try to paint it in the moment exactly the way it looks, you know, and that's like a capturing of an instant, like a snapshot. But mine is more about a whole life, so it's like, it's not just that moment, but it's like what happened before that moment, what happened after that moment. And so it's a, it's all of that has to be in there, you know, for it to capture the feeling that I'm trying to capture. So, you know, I think all, I think a lot of painters uh, are still children. You know, the pure eternists, they're, they're, they they hold on to, they retain their childhood. I mean, I know that Andrew Wyeth did a lot, and I, I learned a lot from Wyeth. And uh, he's like an eternal boy. He definitely, he's like 12 years old when he was 90. You know, for better and for worse. Um, but. There's that honoring of the memory, which has to be pulled up into the moment. And then like, where does it go in the future? How does it that expand from that moment into the future? So you're, you're living, like how is this gonna be read 20, 50, 100 years from now? So you're living in this moment of these two cones connecting, you know, everything that's ever happened up to the present, and then like every possibility of what could, could feed out from that moment. You're living in that eternal moment, that eternal now, as you paint, and you're aware of everything that's ever happened, and you're feeling it, you feel it, you gotta, do, you don't just have memories of it, you gotta own it and feel it, and it's gotta get in the paint, and then like, you know, there's infinite number of possibilities of how it's gonna be interpreted, but, but you're in that vortex constantly. Um, and that's where, for, but for me, the, it's not really right to call it the mystical tradition, but there is this tradition of painters that were, were we're addressing time within their illusionistic, realistic painting. So it, whether it's surrealistic or magical realism or not, those, it has elements of those, but it's many different things at once. It's not really realism. Realism is something like, you know, like the cleaning lady, you know, sweeping the floor. I and mean, that's what realism was, or the rock breakers, you know, it was like Corbet and stuff. This is like, not that, it's something else. So sometimes when there's major events in one's life, you gotta, you know, address it. You have to address it. You can't just like wash it over. You gotta, you gotta put it out there and let people feel what they feel about it.